thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. The topic here today is special needs planning and special needs trust, what you need to know. And if you have a child with special needs, with a disability or a loved one with special needs with, this, with a disability, this is one of the most important topics on earth. You need to understand these issues. You need to understand the, the problems and you need to understand the solutions. And that's what we're here for. Um, this is a big part of what we do. Um, I'm Mark Gilfix. This is Michael Gilfix. It is our privilege and our pleasure to lead you through these really important topics. We mentioned it before, but we won't be taking any questions during the webinar. But if you have questions, please submit them via the Q&A function. Or if you're viewing this later, uh, send us a note, view, uh, leave a question in the comment section of a video. But again, we're so thrilled to have you here today because this is a topic that I think is really close to our hearts because the impact that we can have or that families can have when they create the right type of estate plan that incorporates special needs planning is extraordinary. It is amazing what you can do. So on that note, we're going to share our slides and dive in to the substance of our presentation. And as we get started, I want you to take just a moment to think about and reflect on why you joined us here today. We have so many demands on our time and what is it that drove you to spend this time with us here today? Are you worried about how to protect and support your child after you're gone? And we know this is a particular concern for families with special needs children. Are you worried about saving your home for your child? Uh, are there just a bunch of issues and do you just feel overwhelmed? We certainly can relate to that. And we're here to help. Uh, we truly believe the next 60 minutes could change your family's future. Uh, this is multi-generational stuff. The, the impact can be amazing when you take the right steps, when you have the right documents into place. This is where legal documents can be just so, so, so powerful. So how, how many times have you said this or something very much like it to yourself? Um, you know, you're, you're probably the or a primary caregiver for your child. Uh, you're, you're feeling responsible. You're worried about the future. And you just say, you know, I, I just can't die. I just have to be here all the time. Uh, you know, we've heard this without exaggerating 100, 150 times. So, you know, it's very real. Uh, it drives us, you know, we, we, we get it. Uh, that's perhaps the most important point to make here. So, you know, we just want you to know that, you know, we, we listen as well as talk, believe it or not, as lawyers, we do listen, we do listen. Um, so with that, let's take a look at what the agenda is going to be for the day, for, excuse me, for the next hour. Uh, we're going to touch on just a few of the government benefits that are available to individuals who have a disability. Certainly, we're going to focus on special needs trusts, how they work, what, what are they? Uh, we're going to talk about your home, where your child will live. Proposition 19, brand new law, uh, is central to your thinking, or should be. You'll learn tonight, if you don't already know, why you have to be thinking about it. <clears throat> and then, of course, what can you do? What are the options? What are the steps that you need to take, or at least seriously consider taking at this point in time. We are so going to leave a couple of minutes, I'll just say at the, at the end, to try to answer some questions, but this right. is a lot to cover tonight. It is, it is. And as we dive in, for those of you who know us, who are other clients, who have been to other presentations of ours, welcome. It's great to have you here again. For those of you who don't know us, we just want to take a moment to give you an introduction, because I think it's important that you understand who we are and where we come from as we dive into these important topics. So I'm gonna introduce my co-presenter here, Michael Gilfix. So I've known Michael for over 40 years because he's pretty obviously my, my father. Uh, yes, we are a father-son team, although our firm is much bigger than that. Uh, we have six state planning attorneys. We work as a team on everything, but we, are, uh, at, we were started as a family firm and we're very proud of our heritage. And I think Michael's story is really relevant. Um, he's from a small town in Northern Michigan uh, he came out to the Bay Area to attend Stanford University as an undergrad. He stayed and attended the Stanford Law School. And when he graduated in 1973, he wanted to change the world. He didn't join a big law firm or a big company. He wanted to help people. That's why he went to law school. And he, like any good social entrepreneur, looked for a need. He looked for gaps in the system. He looked for underserved communities. And he found two, older Americans and Americans with disabilities. 
And he went out and he changed the world. He created America's first free legal aid program for the elderly in 1973, SALA, Senior Adults Legal Assistance. It still exists to this day. Not only did he create SALA, but he went around the world, around the country, raised money, trained other attorneys on how to start similar programs around the country. So he was basically one of the founding fathers of the field of elder law, along with my mother, Myra gerson one of the founding mothers of the field. Uh, he really helped create the field and helped serve hundreds of local older Americans and thousands around the country indirectly by helping to create these organizations around the country. He was a founding member of NALA, the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, one of the preeminent organizations in our field. He went in, he also in 1976, started the Disability Law Center, one of the first free legal aid programs for Americans with disabilities. He testified in front of Congress about the laws that protect Americans as they get older or if they have a disability. So this has really been core to what he's done for decades and decades. Uh, in the early 80s, he started Gilfix and the Poll Associates, which is the firm that, that I'm now a part of, and he remained true to his, his core, serving these different communities. Uh, he's been a prolific author in the media throughout the country. He's written books. He's trained hundreds of other attorneys, um, and he's been a national leader. We're very proud of, of, of his history. I'm, I'm proud to have him as my mentor. And I'm also have to always point out that somehow through all of this, he coached all of my little league teams, my basketball teams, my sister's softball teams and basketball teams. I don't know how he found time for all of it, but he did. Um, but that again, we're, we're a family oriented firm. So we've always, family's always been hugely important. So on that note, uh, it's my privilege to introduce my co-presenter here, Michael Gilfix. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, I, I always say coaching kids, I mean, Nothing is more fun than that. So I, I, it was a little selfish. It wasn't all selfless. I have to make that clear. Okay. Um, so let me take a second and uh, let you get to know Mark a little bit. Uh, Mark also went to Stanford, uh, undergraduate, uh, management science and engineering, a very uh, appropriate uh, major uh, for this community, this area. Uh, he went to Loyola Law School, one of the top, another top law school. He was in the top five of his class. He was chosen as the graduation speaker, which is a sort of an accolade. I mean, it, it's a pat on the back from his, his classmates and so forth. His topic, by the way, um, was generosity. Uh, so you know, we love that from day one. So he's, he's carrying it over. Since then, Mark has distinguished himself. He's, he's won awards at the national level for writing, speaking. He and I have given talks on multi-generational planning at national conferences. Goes on and on. Uh, we've co-authored a number of books. One of them you see on the screen is relevant today, The Special Needs Trust Creation and Management Guide. So again, co-authored. Mark is very involved in the community, currently on the board of the Pacific Autism Center for Education, PACE, active with other organizations as well. So, you know, carrying everything forward, uh, successful as an actor as well, but that's that's a kind of another fun, interesting story. But now utterly devoted to this, to this field. And with, without a doubt, he shares the passion we all have here for this particular subset of the area of, of, of law that we cover. So, you know, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me. You can imagine all of you who have kids. Yeah, and we do, your kid. What a kick. We do get along. We do yell at each other sometimes. One time yeah. we were doing a webinar and we were having trouble setting up and we didn't know it was on. And, and I, I admit, I got a little bit short with him because he couldn't, my dad couldn't figure out the microphone or whatever. And I got so frustrated that we realized that everybody was watching us the whole time. We we're like, oh, Okay, so yes, we're very human. So that was entertaining. Um, yeah, it was entertaining. We get over things very fast, though. So if I yell at him here, he yells at me, know that we get over it in about two minutes or we'll be able to work together. Um, just about our firm, uh, we've been around in the Bay Area for 38 years plus. Um, we've served thousands of people and, and really national leaders in special needs planning. Again, we've written books on the subject. I believe our firm was the second in the state of California to do special needs trust. They weren't even called that at the time. So we've been in this community, in this field for a long time, and I've learned so much practicing in this area. And our goal is to provide extraordinary value and, and peace of mind about your child's future. There are a lot of moving parts when it comes to special needs planning, and it's our job to bring them all together for you. So now let's talk about the context for special needs planning and why it's so important for you to take action for your family. Let's just look at autism. And obviously this is just one category. But you look at the number of kids on the autism spectrum. In 2012, it was estimated about one in 68 children was on the autism spectrum. You fast forward to 2018, one in 59. And if you were to go back farther to the early 2000s, late 90s, it was probably you know one in 100, one in 150. So the number of kids 
diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum has gone up and up and up. But the resources available and the community services available through the government have not gone up and up and up. They've remained flat. And in many cases, programs have been cut. So it just speaks to the immense need for support for these communities. And again, we're just talking about autism. That's just one of, of many categories of need. Um, and there's a shortage. And so a lot of this planning is about what can you do as a parent or as a loved one to bridge that gap and to make sure that there's a financial safety net. And autism, again, is just one of, of many issues we deal with. So let's take a look at that. Um, this is an incomplete, always growing list of the diagnoses that our clients have brought to us. Uh, there are syndromes on here you've never heard of, uh, but we have, uh, Kabuki syndrome, uh, cry de chez, on and on. And you know, every time we think we've seen it all, a new diagnosis emerges and we're dealing with it in the context of special needs. And you know, there's two reasons why I, I mentioned this. Number one, just to show the breadth of our experience. I mean, this is an amazing list if you, if you look at it, it's truly amazing. And, and the second reason is it just shows that you know, everybody's different. Um, there is no one size fits all. I, I just can't overemphasize that. That you know, it's, in a way, you know, it's easy for an attorney to get a form special needs trust and there you go. But you know, do you really understand the nuances, the subsets and all of that? So again, you know, our experience is off the charts. You know, it amazes me every time I look at this. Um, and it's a, it, it, it bespeaks our, our service to you and our, our devotion to the field. And I think everyone here can relate to this. Um, certainly I can personally. Um, a diagnosis changes everything. And that can be your own medical issue or a diagnosis of, of an issue with a loved one. And your whole world shifts on its axis and, and everything changes and your priorities change right away and your needs and your worries change right away. And that's what this is all about, uh, covering some of those critical, critical needs. So understanding what you can do, how you can take action when you face these stresses, I think is just so immensely powerful. So along those lines, we're going to highlight, it's not the focus of our talk here today, but we just want to go over some of the really important public benefits programs of which you should be aware. This is not by any means exhaustive. We're not going to go into too much detail, but these are different programs that an individual with a disability could be eligible for, where they can get help. Um, we're also going to talk about what disability means in the eyes of, of the law, you know, what you need to have in place or the condition you need to have in order to be eligible for a lot of these. So one program is SSDI, there's SSI, there's Medicare, there's Medicaid, there's Medi-Cal, there's IHSS, there's Section 8 housing, and this is just a, a small subsection of programs available. Some really important programs, though, SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, that's a program that anybody who pays in if they face a disability later, can get money back through this program. There's no test of how much you have in the bank. So Elon Musk, if he became disabled, could get SSDI because he's paid into the system. They don't care how much money he has in the bank. SSI, Supplemental Security Income, on the other hand, that's for an individual with a disability who has below, usually the number is about $2,000 in assets. So if you have more than $2,000 in your name, you can't get SSI. Uh, Medicare, that's a program that everybody gets when they reach a certain age. Medicaid, or as we in California call it, Medi-Cal, that is a program you can become eligible for if you have a disability. But just like SSI, you don't get Medi-Cal if you have too many assets, if you have too much in the bank, or if you are over $2,000 in countable assets. Countable assets, that's key. And a lot of special needs planning is about making sure there are assets to support someone without going over the limits for these very important programs. IHSS, in-home support services, Section 8 housing, that's a really important program, although uh, it's, it's a lot of these are don't provide enough support or they're really hard to get on the list and get through the waiting list to get the benefits, like in, this, in the instance of Section 8. So really important programs. Again, that's not the focus of our talk here today, um, but critically, you have to plan ahead to make sure that your loved one will be eligible in the future. Let's spend just a moment to talk about what we mean by disability. I mean, that can be a loaded term. And one thing that I always like to point out is just because you have a disability in the eyes of the law or for eligibility for these programs doesn't mean you're in incompetent or um, unable to manage your affairs or incapacitated or, or limited in any meaningful way. It really is a very specific diagnosis. It just means you have some condition or issue that means you have an inability to maintain substantial gainful employment. 
And that means an inability to have a job that pays enough to support yourself um, based on some issues. It doesn't have to be a disability, it usually is, but it could also, it could even be a drug addiction or alcoholism. It could be mental illness. It could be a physical limitation. There's a broad range. There's not like a specific type of diagnosis in order to become disabled in the eyes of the law. Again, doesn't mean you're incompetent or incapacitated. And for uh, eligibility for many of these programs, you have to have $2,000 or less in countable assets. So let's take a look at the program that provides an income. It's core. It's one of the most important programs. It's one for which an individual qualifies once 18 years of age, if disabled, and who qualifies in terms of having limited assets. So. Um, what SSI is designed to do by federal law is it is designed to pay for your food for an individual's food and shelter. Now, $954 a month in the Bay Area, you know, it can't do that. Mm -hmm. So it, the whole world, including eligibility workers, know that people can't live on that, that they're getting money from some other source. So it's kind of a fiction, but nevertheless, it's important because if an individual receives help with rent or food from some other source, they could lose a part of their SSI check. We have seen trusts drafted where it says, under no circumstances shall money in the special needs trust be used to pay for food or shelter because they were concerned about losing SSI. And frankly, that's a big mistake. Um, the worst that happens, as we'll see in a moment, is the SSI check goes down somewhat. But remember, you know, this isn't about maximizing the check. This is about quality of life. So money can be used to pay for food and shelter if needed. It can be used very generally. Uh, in the trust doesn't interfere with your SSI. Again, it's a matter of coordinating how these things work together. If somebody qualifies for SSI, they automatically qualify for Medi-Cal. And sometimes that's the most important point. Uh, health insurance, broad health insurance, imperfect as it is, Medi-Cal is a comprehensive health insurance program. So get SSI, you automatically have Medi-Cal going along with you. So what if you have a situation where somebody needs help paying rent? What happens? That's where the ism comes in. So if an individual is getting help with food or shelter and or shelter, it is indeed possible that a portion of their SSI check could be reduced, but only reduced, only reduced. All that happens, let's say somebody's rent is paid entirely. Will they lose their SSI check? No. Will they have a slight decrease? Yes. The decrease is one third of the federal amount. A portion of the check is from the state. So the federal amount, as you see, is $794. So if somebody has complete rent paid, they're only going to lose 600, excuse me, $264 from their, their monthly check. Not a big deal if the rent is paid. So, so again, it's an opportunity. It's not a barrier. You just have to be aware of that. If money is in an ABLE Act account, which Mark will talk about a little bit later, that money doesn't count in terms of a problem with eligibility and the money can be used to pay for rent and it does not affect SSI. Again, how these programs fit together. Well, it's already a little bit later because I'm going to talk about the ABLE Act. Uh, what is the ABLE Act? It's Achieving a Better Life Experience. It was passed in around 2014. It took California a while to put it into place as those of you who, who maybe use it know it took the state like three years or so before it was really set up here um, in typical California bur bureaucratic fashion. But what is the ABLE Act? Um, it allows an individual with a disability to set up a special account, an ABLE Act account, and there are financial institutions that partnered with the state to do this, and up to $15,000 per year can be put into this account, and it can grow tax-free. Now, there's a limit. It doesn't matter how many people are putting money into it. Anybody can. The, the individual with a disability can put his or her own money. It can be from a parent, a godparent, a friend, whatever. But there is a cap of $15,000 per year from, from all sources. That money gets to grow tax-free, kind of like a 529 plan. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, and no matter how, well, not no matter how much, but the money in an ABLE Act account doesn't count against government benefits eligibility. So remember, we said you can have only under $2,000. Uh, or if you have over $2,000, you can't get SSI. You could have $50,000 in an ABLE Act account, and it doesn't count against that limit. So it's really nice. You can still maintain eligibility for government benefits. The assets can be used for a wide variety of expenses. So it, it can, it's a really nice tool. Um, the individual with a disability, him or herself, can manage the account, or they can appoint someone else to. Um, so they can be used for a wide variety of needs. A couple issues, though. 
And this is why they do not take the place of a special needs trust. Don't rely on the ABLE apps to cover your child over the long term or your loved one over the long term. Why? Well, there's a $100,000 limit. So you can keep putting $15,000 per year in one of these accounts. They can grow tax free. But if you get over $100,000, you start to lose eligibility for government benefits programs. So you have to keep the total under $100,000. So it can never be that powerful of a financial safety net because as much as $100,000 is, that doesn't support an individual for very long if they have no other source of support or income, even if they're getting SSI. Uh, additionally, if someone passes away and there's money left in this account, the state of California gets first dibs. It's not going to go to other family members. The state of California keeps track of what benefits were paid out during someone's life. And they say, okay, we, put, we spent $200,000 on, on benefits for this individual. There's 80,000 left in the ABLE Act account when they passed away. We're taking all 80,000 of that to get paid back. So it's a great tool but we view it as something that's complementary to, to a special needs trust and other planning, not something that takes its place. So again, wonderful tool. We're glad it's there, but it is by no means a panacea. Uh, and by the way, a parent can create that account as well as the disabled individual herself. Um, okay, ne next point is just so important that there are so many programs available in our state. Some counties have their own programs, some cities. Uh, we are very involved in the communities and we know where these other programs are uh, underutilized. So many people are unaware of their existence. So again, just broadly making the point that knowing the special needs community and resources is complementary to all of the legal planning that you're going to be doing. So let's talk about whether somebody can work and receive SSI, Mark. Yeah, I think that the answer is just yes. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but I think a lot of people think, well, if my if my loved one is getting SSI, they, they can't work, right? That, that limits them. Why should I even think about SSI if they can't work? There are a number of programs that do allow for limited work hours or different programs where an individual absolutely can work and still receive SSI. But you have to be kind of careful with that. So, and I see we're getting some good questions. We're going to try to get to those at the end of the presentation. So again, feel free to, to give us questions via the Q&A function. We'll get to some of those at the end. And, and note to Mike and Mark, we're getting a little behind. We're to okay. To well, yeah, we I are, think we're, we're doing all out of here in an hour. We might go slightly over an hour, but not much. We promise. We'll be very efficient with your time. Here's what not to do. We're telling you a lot of what to do. I want to take just a moment of what not to do. And we get this question a lot. Well, I have a son and a daughter. My son's on the autism spectrum and my daughter is doing really well. She's making a lot of money. She works at a tech company. Why do I have to bother with this? Why don't I just leave everything? to my daughter and she can just take care of my son. They have a great relationship. And after I'm gone, I'm just so confident that she'll take care of him. Don't do that. There are, just don't do that. Um, there are a number of reasons why, but here are just a few examples of why we don't recommend this. If you leave all extra money to one child in the hopes that that child will take care of their sibling, that child is gonna be stuck in a zero sum game for the rest of his or her life. If they have their own family or their own expenses, they're going to have to decide, well, do I use this money to support my sibling or do I use it to support my kids? You know, what if they get sued? What if they have medical issues of their own? What if they just take a big financial hit and don't have much money left? Um, what if they get divorced and they don't have a protective structure in place? So a number of things can leave that money very exposed and it puts them in a very tough situation. It can really strain their relationships because again, one child would then almost become a burden to the other in the sense that they have to use their own money to support the sibling. And it becomes a very, very tough situation fraught with issues. And, and then if something happens to one sibling, well, there's no real safety net there in case you know the, the high earning um, sister gets sick or incapacitated or God forbid passes away. You know, There's really nothing there for, for the other child. So for a number of reasons, do not leave money to one child hoping that they will take care of the other child. Instead, special needs trust. This is what you need to create a special needs trust. Now, if you already have one, you need to take a fresh look at it. If you don't have one, you need to set this up. If you have a loved one who could benefit from this, it is the heart of special needs planning. And as I always like to point out, just to give you kind of an idea of how critical this is, this is one of the most important documents you will ever sign. Um, it can provide a lifetime of wonderful protection for your child and can empower people you trust to oversee that money for your child. Uh, so some more details about this, a special needs trust is a, it's a trust structure designed to hold assets for the benefit of an individual with a disability without disturbing eligibility for public benefits. It has to be irrevocable, so you can't just change them all the time. The law requires that they're kind of set in place. Um, but put simply, they're a way to hold any amount of money 
where that money, if it's set up the right way, does not have to be reported as belonging to the individual who, who might be applying for SSI or Medi-Cal. They don't, if they can say they have a special needs trust, but the money in that trust doesn't count against the $2,000 limit. So it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. It can provide that lifelong safety net. We have a screenshot here of the book that Michael Gilfix and I uh, co-authored, Special Needs Trust Creation and Management Guide. We just published uh, a, a new edition very recently that's available on our website. For any clients who work with us, we, we give away a complimentary copy. Um, you can also order that on our website, but it, it really encapsulates how we think about this. But I think it's indicative of the fact that we think about this a lot. It's not just the trust. It's how does the rest of your plan fit into that? Uh, because it, uh, an estate plan is only as good as its weakest link, you know, kind of like a chain. So you have to make sure that you have the right structure for a special needs trust, but that the rest of your plan is structured the right way to make sure there's something left and then it goes the right, it flows properly to that special needs trust. Well, let's just emphasize a couple of quick points here that a special needs trust can hold real property, it can hold the family home if you want it to be there for your child. And then it's the issue of what's the cost of care going to be and how much do you need to set aside? You know, if you can, uh, the cost of care is significant. It's cost on many levels. Let's just take a look at the, uh, at the numbers, by the way, on the next slide. So this, these are numbers from JAMA, a very prestigious resource. Uh, conservative estimates, this is from a number of years ago, you know, up to two and a half million dollars to, to support an individual on the autism spectrum. And it can be, it can be higher as we know. But you know, there are other costs as well. The stress on families, divorce rates being higher for in families where there's a, where there's a child with a special need. So, you know, again, it's a comprehensive approach where we're trying to alleviate the stress on everybody. Financial is one side of it, but but not just that. And how can you think about, well, let's talk about funding? Yeah. So so how can you be sure? that there is that financial safety net because you can set up the best trust on earth, but if there's no money in it, it, does, it might not do that much good. So how can you be certain that there's enough money for your child and calculating how much is enough? I've given talks on this at the, um, the Autism Society Conference a couple of years ago, how much is enough? I gave a whole talk about how you might think about this. And there are a number of ways to think about it. Um, but largely speaking, you hope that there's enough in the special needs trust to support your child for the rest of his or her life, that that money will not run out. Um, so you want to be conservative. How can you be sure that there is a, a safety net? And, and one really wonderful tool in this field can be life insurance. Um, it can provide a, a great safety net. And so let's look at an example that'll really make this point. Um, this is a very real situation from uh, a number of years ago. There we are. Uh, this is a couple with a, a child with severe disabilities. Husband, 48 years of age, wife, 45. Good health, which is, which is significant. They needed, they needed to know that there would be at least a million dollars in the special needs trust when they passed away. They were not wealthy. Uh, they had some support from their parents, but it was very challenging for them to think about their, their kid's future. So we looked at what the options would be and they bought what was known, still is known as a second to die policy. So the policy doesn't pay off until the second death is between the husband and wife. So that means the insurance company holds the money longer, more benefit for the, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, premiums that are paid. So here are the two options. And you know, I think this shows that this is within the reach of, of most of us. The two options they looked at were annual premiums. You see about $4,300 a year, not cheap, but not, not, not horrific or the option they chose was a single premium, one payment of $60,000, and they were done. They got a little help from one of their parents. Uh, and the, you know, by the way, these are never term policies. So this is a lock on a $1 million life insurance policy. And I think you can see that you set money aside and then regardless of how the rest of your estate goes, you're gonna have that baseline number of dollars there for your child. Okay, what about IRAs, 401ks, retirement accounts? Yes, of course, you can leave those funds to special needs trusts as well. The trusts have to be properly drafted. I won't go through the technicalities, but um, there needs to be appropriate language in the trust to accommodate this. Not that hard. You just have to, write, have to have the right language. Now, some of you may have heard about the SECURE Act, which you see at the bottom of the screen. This is new law, effective January 1, 2020, and it changed the rules about inherited IRAs. It was the case as you were doing your planning, that you could leave your IRA to a child and they could stretch it out over their lifetime, take it out over 20, 30, 40 years. That was attractive to many folks. Well, that's gone. Now, the IRA money has to be taken out over only 10 years. However, 
an exception. And this is why it's relevant to our talk today. If you have a child with a disability or, you, or, or a special needs trust set up for that child, you can still leave that IRA to or for the benefit of your child with a disability, and it can be stretched out over that child's lifetime. And again, to many folks, that's very attractive. So it's a planning point. It's one of the considerations when you go through the process of deciding how to fund the trust, which assets go to which kid, how is it all going to be coordinated? So again, the SECURE Act limits things in some ways, but it actually creates some opportunities. And if you do have questions about life insurance, there are some professionals we've worked with in this area for, for many years who we have an active relationship with who really specialize and really help a lot of families in this area. If you have an old life insurance policy, that you've had for a while, that's whole life, there are often options to sell those and trade them in for much better policies in many cases. So bottom line is if you're interested in this, contact us and we have some professionals who really know what they're doing and focus on this area. So just to illustrate why it's so important to set up a special needs trust, uh, I just want to tell a very quick story of Mary, a public benefits recipient, what we call the curse of the small inheritance. So Mary uh, has, has a disability. Again, there's an issue where she cannot work full time. Maybe she has uh, um, is on the autism spectrum and, and she just can't maintain gainful employment to the level she can support herself. And she's getting SSI and Medi-Cal, among other benefits. John, her, her uncle, well-meaning uncle, made a bequest to her. He passes away, sadly, but he leaves her $60,000. And that might sound great. Well, Mary has $60,000. But the problem is, if he didn't set up a special needs trust or if he didn't coordinate with her parents to leave assets to a special needs trust, well, she has to report that $60,000 is belonging to her. And that kicks her off of SSI, that kicks her off of Medi-Cal, that interferes with her government benefits. And there are some steps she can take to protect it, but then she has to hire a lawyer and she has to take a bunch of steps. And then she has to use the money. Usually she ends up burning through that money until it's gone. And then she has to reapply for Medi-Cal. She has to reapply for SSI. So Mary doesn't end up any better off than she would have had he not left her a penny. Uh, because there wasn't the right plan in place. So that's why, and we've seen this. I've had many clients who've come in and said, hey, I just inherited a little bit of money. What do I do? Um, I'm going to lose my, my SSI and Medi-Cal. I mean, we have clients who come to us because they're freaked out because they're about to inherit some money. And what can we do to protect it? They're freaked out that a relative, a well-meaning relative left some money to their child. So what can we do? Well, we need to set up a special needs trust ahead of time, ideally. The most common type of special needs trust is what we call a third party special needs trust. Third party refers to where the money comes from. It means that the money never belonged to the beneficiaries. This only came from third party sources. It can be from anybody, by the way, other than the beneficiary. It's not just parents. It can be from siblings, even from friends, from uncles, aunts, most commonly is from parents. Usually third party trusts, special needs trusts are funded when a parent, when parents pass away, they say in their plan, I'm leaving this share of my estate to the special needs trust, um, you know, for my daughter or for my son, but they can be funded while a parent is living. Uh, there are many situations where it actually makes sense for a parent to transfer money into a special needs trust. Often if a parent needs long-term care of their own, we, we advise that if there's tax issues uh, or if a, if a loved one or family member leaves money to that, that special needs trust, when they pass away, it might be long before mom and dad pass away, there could be money. in it. But the bottom line is money can come into it really at any point once it's set up. Um, an individual can leave up to $11.7 million to a special needs trust without any estate or gift tax, because that is the current estate tax exemption, the amount that you can leave to anybody free of estate or gift taxes. Now that number could go way down in the future, but that's a totally different issue. But you can leave a lot to a special needs trust now without any tax issues. And again, it can be from a grandparent, it can be from an aunt, it can be to an uncle, from an uncle, or a combination of all of the above into one special needs trust. So whenever we set up a special needs trust for a family, we want them to inform other family members. So they update their estate plans to make sure that money flows into the special needs trust and not directly to a child. So critical to coordinate all of this. Well, that's a third party trust. The other type of special needs trust is known as a first party special needs trust. So the third party is usually mom and dad, somebody's money other than the disabled individual's money. First party means it's, the, it's created by or for the benefit of the individual with a disability and his or her money goes into the trust. So, to create this trust and the disabled individual can create it himself, a parent can create it and, and others must be disabled under age 65. Uh, this trust, unlike the third party trust that Mark talked about, 
this has to include a provision saying that upon the death of the beneficiary, to the extent that that individual received government benefits, it has to be paid back to the state. So these trusts tend to have smaller amounts of money for that reason, but it isn't it's a solution. So now let's look at where that money could come from. It's somewhat logical, but just where could that come from? We've had so many parents when their kids were very young before they knew about any disability, they set up these uniform transfer to minors act accounts. Yeah, they put they put the annual exclusion amount. Now it's 15,000 a year. That can grow quickly. Next thing you know, there's 100, 200,000 dollars in it. So the child turns 18, is disabled, if down to 2000, gets SSI, Medi-Cal, and so forth, but here's this money. Well, this, the first party trust can be created, and that money goes into the trust, and you have government benefits. It's taken care of. Mark mentioned, what if there are inherited assets? A personal injury award comes up all the time. When there's a settlement, rather than going to the individual, it goes into a trust, so that person can keep benefits. Receives a gift. Any reason why that money comes into the hands of the beneficiary this is the solution. Very practical. Yeah, but the bottom line, you really want ideally to plan ahead to avoid having to do this. If it's a third party trust, you're the first party trust, the state can go after any money left when the individual passes away. A third party special needs trust, the state of California cannot go after money left. It, it sure makes the point that there are solutions. You know, when problems come up, there's always a solution. And when, whenever you create a special needs trust, one of the critical, the two most important things the money is exempt from government benefits eligibility, but two, you get to name the trustee, the person in charge of that trust for the benefit of your child. So let's talk about that. Uh, this is the topic that can consume 45 minutes of a one hour meeting. Who's gonna be the trustee? So when you set up that trust for your child, you're the trustee, husband and wife, you're both co-trustees, but who's gonna take over when you're gone? Um, no decision is more important. They're gonna control the purse strings. They're going to decide how the money is utilized. And if that doesn't go to the core of quality of life for your child, nothing does. So how do you think it through? Here's, here's our approach. Ideally, you do have a responsible family member who can do it. Sometimes that's another child who take care of his sibling. Sometimes that doesn't work. You know, you got to be so careful. We have a list of criteria we would walk you through before you make a final decision. Um, you know, the, the ideal trustee, by the way, is your uh, niece who knows your child, uh, is devoted to your child. Half, she, th this niece happens to be a CPA, uh, lives in Omaha, isn't too nearby, and has nothing but time on her hands. So there's your ideal trustee. Very few of us have that person well, in our lives. But it takes a lot of time yeah. to be a trustee. Yeah, that time on their hands. Is so if you don't find somebody there, uh, sometimes, rarely, there's a trusted friend somebody who's been involved with your child for a very long time and has built up trust. It's a challenge so that you don't make this choice casually. So if you don't find somebody in the, in the personal realm, there are individuals who serve who are professionals. Two categories. Primarily, it's professional fiduciaries. These are people who are in the business of being a trustee. It's what they do to make a living. Many attorneys serve as trustees of these trusts. Not all, but many, and again, have to be careful. They're willing and able. If you don't find somebody in the first circle, the individual, the family member, the friend, or the second circle, the individual professionals, then you look to banks or other financial institutions. There are some banks that actually cultivate special needs trust management. There are other banks that won't do them at all because it's tough. It, it's harder to be efficient and make as much money. And you know, banks are businesses. Uh, fees can be one, one and a half, two percent of the money managed. They're not insignificant. Individual professionals, typically 1%, sometimes an hourly rate. So, you know, you'd inquire into that. But just to emphasize, you know, the fees that are charged should be significant because it's a significant responsibility. You shouldn't let fees be the determining factor. Let, let's be real clear about that. If you name so, a family, if it's a family member, they can charge fees as well up to what a professional would charge. So when we, you're talking to people, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility, but assuming there's enough money in the trust, you know, they certainly can pay themselves a reasonable a reasonable rate. So sometimes the idea comes up, let's have a family member and a professional be co-trustees. You know, that'll save money. It'll have family involvement. First thing to say, it's not going to save money. Uh, many professionals will even refuse to serve if there's a family member as a co-trustee. Because of course, logically, their, their job won't be easier. Their job is going to be tougher. So, you know, that's a little bit dicey, but it comes up all the time. <laughs> the last category are what are called pooled trusts. There are 
entities, nonprofit organizations that manage these trusts. So the idea is there's 10, 20, 40, 50 families, maybe the size of the estate isn't that large, and a lot of banks wouldn't take those trusts because they but there's not enough money there. So they pool the money. So then generating enough fees to sustain the staff. There are a number of pool trusts in existence in California on the list of options if there's no other alternative. Frankly, it's not our primary go-to option, although some attorneys find them to be optimal. Mm -hmm. Tough, tough decision. Um, not just for the kids. So let's make this point. Usually we think about parents setting these trusts up for kids, you know, not necessarily the only category. We've had so many grandparents set them up for the grandkid, you know, for the grandparent grandchild relationship. I mean, you know, that's, that's pretty special, regardless of how you want to look at that word. Um, often people set up these trusts for their parents. If you have a parent who is, you know, God forbid in a nursing home and they're getting Medi-Cal coverage, you're their safety net financially. If they need something, you're going to pay it. So if you were you know, to predecease them, you put money into a special needs trust for your parent. Doesn't interfere with eligibility. Life goes on in a more supportive way. Uh, we mentioned, I think I might have mentioned that we had a, grant, a godchild recently set up a special needs trust for her, for her godchild. Anybody can do it. You know, it's not restricted to parent-child. So you know, we think creatively. It comes up all the time. And we often get the question, well, you know, my child's relatively young. They, yeah, they might have issues that might prevent them from working, but they might be okay in the future. Should I still set up a special needs trust? The answer invariably is yes. When in doubt, create the special needs trust. There's a few reasons for this. One is if you create the special needs trust, even if you pass away and money goes into it and later the child is thriving and working, it's not like that money's not available to them. If someone, the trustee of that trust, if a child is working and making lots of money and no longer thinking about public benefits, or if there's just enough money in the trust and they don't need government benefits, well, the trustee could be more flexible in how he or she distributes money. So it actually, in some ways, just makes the trust more flexible. If someone's getting government benefits, the trustee has to be a little bit more careful with how they distribute money. Um, the trust can also terminate. We've had many clients who say, look, if my child successfully is employed and doing well for a minimum period of two or three years, I want to give the trustee the right to end the trust and just distribute that money outright. Um, you can also set up the trust. And if you see your child doing really well, you can update your estate plan later and, and no longer leave money directly to the trust. So bottom line is our job is to help you cover that worst case scenario and make sure that safety net is there. So we want it to be there. But even if things go better than planned, it's not a bad thing to have the special needs trust. You just have a third party in charge of it and we can build in all sorts of flexibility there. So not the end, it's a wonderful thing if, if a child no longer needs it, the money's still there to support them. Along those lines, you know, what can, a, what can a special needs trust pay for? You know, is it limited to just a very specific category? No, uh, a special needs trust, the funds can be used for a wide range of expenses and uses ranging from entertainment, uh, movies, going to shows, travel, cable bills, cell phone bills, car costs, clothing, food and, food and shelter. We talked about how it might reduce SSI, but it wouldn't it wouldn't eliminate it. Furniture, uh, medical care, companionship. Uh, companionship. Um, uh, let me insert. We were uh, tangentially involved in a case in New York recently where the question was, and it went to court, a judge had to decide this. Can the trustee use money in a special needs trust to pay for sexual favors for the male beneficiary? <laughs> and the answer, and the I got to tell you, the wording of the judge's opinion was hilarious. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, that judge ruled that the money could be used for that form of companionship. Quality yeah, I, of life, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I've, ta I've talked to some professional fiduciaries who are very open that, that and we don't want to focus on this too much, but that have <laughs> paid for their beneficiary to go to Nevada where brothels are legal and, and paid for that. That just makes the point. We're not recommending that by any means. Just makes the point that it's flexible. Another question you might have is, could you use money for Britney Spears concert tickets? None of you had that question, I know. But you, the answer is yes. Uh, and there's actually a court case about this. Someone challenged the use of special needs trust funds to pay for Britney Spears tickets. It was the early 2000s when Britney was the queen of pop and a judge said yes. So again, it makes the point, I, I disagree with this ruling just because I, I was never a Britney Spears fan. But, uh, but the point is money can be used for a wide variety of uses. Now, it, the trustee needs to keep track of things and show that it was something to support the beneficiary, but it's flexible. So this money's not locked away. 
for and, and barely used for your loved one. Let's shift gears just a little bit to the fear of, of homelessness. Um, obviously, throughout California, really throughout the country, especially after the COVID crisis, homelessness is rising. You know, the number of people who are unhoused is growing. Um, we're facing these issues more and more. And if you look at the percentage of individuals who are who are homeless who have mental illness or another disability, it's a shockingly high percentage because most people don't have families who, who, who are able to support them or who are able to put these safety nets into place ahead of time. But absolutely, there are tools and options out there to provide housing for, for your loved one. And here are some, here are some specific programs. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was looking at we have uh, we're up to 19 or 20 questions already. We're not going to be able to cover all. We'll we'll choose a couple. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Housing options. Okay, so you know we prioritize this. This is the fear, as Mark said, that so many have. But where is my child going to live? If you are privileged enough to own a home and you can organize things so that the home can be preserved for your child, that's often the go-to strategy. We're going to emphasize the impact of Proposition 19, which relates directly to your thinking about where your child is going to live and whether he or she can live in your home. From another perspective, Section 8 is an opportunity. Uh, Section 8, you have to get a voucher, you have to qualify, very hard to get. Um, money, by the way, in an ABLE Act account doesn't interfere with Section 8 eligibility at all, but getting a voucher and finding a landlord who would take it, that's a real challenge. So when we list these things, we're not saying they're all viable, but they're on the list of options. Group homes, there's a number of nonprofit organizations that manage them. Uh, LSA is one that we work with. It's a wonderful organization, Life Service Alternatives. Uh, Morgan Center, Pace, a number of other organizations have group homes. Private sector initiatives are remarkable. This is where families get together, they pool their money, they buy land, they create a housing community. We're, we're working with two different groups that have done this successfully. They've broken ground, they're already under construction. So yes, you do have to have more money to be able to participate, but it sort of underscores the need, the need for creativity and the need for peace of mind to know that you found a place for your child to be. So, you know, we look at housing, homelessness uh, as the most serious issue in so many cases and help you come up with practical solutions that are gonna fit your situation. And Prop 19 is a major, major issue. We're going to illustrate that in a moment. But right, and, and let's be really clear about this point, uh, because this question comes up recurrently, even though the answer is always yes. Money in a special needs trust can be used to own a house, to purchase a house, to pay rent. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, that's what it's all about. It isn't just cash that can sit in a special needs trust. So let's look a little bit more about the house and why we have to start thinking about some of the other issues that come up as you look at preserving assets and ultimately Prop 19. So, you know, think about your home and how valuable it is and how it's doubled in value over the last 10 years, maybe more than doubled, and there's no end in sight. Um, logic says, the market says that they're going to continue to increase in value. So, you know, maybe that's good, but what if you want to leave your, your house for your child or you have a second home and you want that to be the house for your child to live in? Can that work? Is there going to be enough money there to, to pay property taxes? Not something we had to worry about earlier before Prop 19, but now we do. So Mark, let's tackle Prop 19. Yeah, so, so what we used to have was something called Prop 58, which let parents transfer their primary residence as long as it was to their kids. It didn't matter if their kids lived there or not kids got to keep mom and dad's low property taxes because property tax are protect, increases are protected by Prop 13. So kids could inherit you know, a $5 million home and pay $3,000 a year in property taxes if mom and dad had owned it a long time. Additionally, previously, you could pass up to $1 million in assessed value property beyond your house. So if you could own you know, three fourplexes, and if the assessed, not the fair market, but the assessed, that's the Prop 13 value, of all three was below a million dollars, well, all three of those could also go to kids with no change in property taxes. That's all gone. So now there are no protections for rental properties. Um, rental properties or second homes or vacation homes are now fully reassessed when they go from parent to child. And the protections for the primary residents have been gutted. And I think that's what a lot of people miss. I think a lot of people saw Prop 19, they saw some good things about what you can do about moving around the state and funding for firefighters and things like that, but they didn't necessarily understand the fine print. The fine print was 
most people thought, well, if, if it's a if a parent leaves their primary residence to their kid, and if their kid lives there, well, they get still get protected. That's only partially right. Now there's a limit of how much protection a child will get. The limit is only one million dollars in fair market value is protected from a reassessment if it goes from parent to child. Now that might seem like a lot of money, but most <clears throat> houses in the Bay Area are worth well more than a million dollars. So if it's a, a parent's owned a house for a long time. This can, even if a child lives in the house, even if a special needs child lives in the family home after mom and dad pass away, you could be looking at increases in property taxes of tens of thousands of dollars per year. Now add that up over five years, 10 years, 20 years. And those taxes are going up every year, by the way. And you are looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's just give a quick illustration. Jill and Amos, both of them own $3 million houses. They're worth $3 million, but the assessed value is only $300,000 because they both own their houses for decades. They were very lucky. They bought houses in you know, Mountain View in, in the early 70s. And so their assessed value is only $300,000. So they're only paying around $3,000 a year in property taxes. Both of them pass away in 2022. They leave it to their, their daughters. When Jill passes away, her daughter inherits the house and she decides to live there. And a lot of people thought, oh, if the daughter, if she lives there, no change in property taxes. Wrong. Only the first million dollars of that $3 million in fair market value is protected from, a, from an increase in property taxes. $3 million minus $1 million. $2 million is exposed to a property tax increase. So property taxes go from $3,000 a year to well over $20,000 per year. Amos, on the other hand, identical residence, same tax situation. When he passes away, it goes to his daughter. And whether she lives there or not, property taxes stay at $3,000 a year. How is that possible? Very simply, Amos took action. Amos worked with us to come up with a solution and our firm has come up with a solution. Um, there are ways where you can protect your home from being reassessed when you pass away using LLC structures. We have a, a new approach we can call the Dynasty LLC. There's no one size fits all. It's kind of a combination of approaches where we use new structures like LLCs where properties can be transferred from parent to child or involving special needs trusts with no change in property taxes. This can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in future property taxes. Property taxes alone could eat up half the, half the funds in a special needs trust if you don't take action. So without, we can't go into too many details because there is no simple way, but we have a few different approaches we've developed within this umbrella. The key thing is we can prevent future property tax increases if you work with us. So that, that's the main point here. And it's, it's just beyond critical. Any points you add there, Mike? No, I think the only message you get across, it's so complicated, frankly. Uh, our tax attorney, uh, Mr. LaPole, developed the solution, solutions. Uh, you just, you know, it's our assurance that we can deal with this protectively. Um, that's not the understanding generally in the community. The, the, that's, that you can't do anything. Yep. Not the case. Not we, true. We, you work we with the right strategy, thing. of course. Mm -hmm. So let's go on, Mark, and let's talk just a little bit about trusts. Yeah, Revocable so, trusts. Yeah, right. So, so a special needs trust is only one part of your plan. You obviously need to have the rest of your plan in place. And we already, this is a question I'll sort of address. Special needs trust, someone asked, does it, can it be part of your living trust or does it need to be separate? It needs to be separate in our view. We see other, other trusts are drafted where a special needs trust is created from mom and dad's existing trust. When they pass away, that is not how we do things for a number of reasons. We already talked about the fact that other relatives might want to leave money to that special needs trust while mom and dad are alive. Um, uh, you, you might want to transfer money to special needs trust while you're alive. You need a separate structure for that. So you need to look at your own living trust, your revocable living trust. If you don't have one, you need one. If you have one, you need to take a fresh look at it every few years. You know, laws have changed significantly in the last few years. They're likely to change significantly in the next couple of years when it comes to estate taxes. Any, anything you'd add here, Mike? No, I think it's a matter of integrating and knowing that everything has to be, everything has to fit. That's, a, that's our main point. Yeah, you, you can't look at this as just one piece. It, an estate plan is only as good as its weakest link. So you have to make sure your overall estate plan is up to date. Now, we're, on, we're getting towards the end. I promise we're gonna wrap it up pretty soon. But a couple really important points here. What can you do for other children? You know, you, maybe you have one child who has a disability. If you have other children who you think are gonna make a lot of money and hope to have families of their own or at least have good jobs, what can you do to protect them? Well, we recommend, and the majority of our clients do this, we recommend that you don't leave any money to your other kids. 
Instead, you leave them to trusts for their benefit. Now, why would you do this? And what type of trust are we talking about? We're talking about family protection trust. That's our firm's version of what is generically known as a dynasty trust. Why does Bernie Sanders want to get rid of these? This is not a political statement. He's just on record saying he doesn't think that these are fair, but they are legal. Um, there's a lot in the media about this. You could Google the term um, dynasty trust. You could see a lot. Now, why would you leave money to a family protection trust rather than to a child directly? Well, if your child gets divorced, if you leave money to them directly, it can get commingled, it can be lost. If it's in a family protection trust, there is a high level of protection against a divorce settlement. It should not be lost to your child's ex-wife or ex-husband. If your child is sued, if they inherit the money directly, it's fair game in a lawsuit. If it's in a trust, there's a barrier, there's a protection. Nothing is guaranteed, but someone would have to break the trust to get to that money. It's a big deterrent for litigants, and it, it usually protects that money totally. On the death of your child, when assets go from your child to grandchildren or future grandchildren, this is critical and it's hard to wrap your head around, but the money in this trust plus the growth of the value of assets in that trust during your child's life, it's not part of your child's taxable estate. That is a huge deal. Even if you don't think of yourself as a multimillionaire now, let's say someone inherits $2 million, which is you know a small house in the Bay Area over their life. The value of that house could double, triple you know, over 10, 20 years, 4 million, 6 million, 8 million. When that child passes away, if it's theirs in their name, that could all be exposed to estate taxes 20, 30, 40 years from now, 50% of it could be lost. If it's in a family protection trust, subject to some limits, largely all, almost all of that, if not all of it, can continue for the grandkids with zero estate tax exposure. It can save millions of dollars for future generations. And it's not like you're tying your kid's hands. Um, you can name your child to be his or her own trustee down the road if you think they're responsible. A lot of our clients will say, hey, after I'm gone, my child's over 30 years old, they can be in charge of their own trust. So you're not tying your hands. This is a tool that ultra wealthy families have been using for a long time. And we believe that all families who own a home, you know, should be aware of this. And most of our clients do decide to create these trusts for their kids. They're not just for the ultra wealthy, just so, so powerful. So again, you know, the focus here is on special needs planning, but there are ways that we think you should protect assets for, for all of your children. Um, if, if you think and you plan ahead, it is extraordinary what you can accomplish. So let's circle back to the, the topic at hand here. You know, what do you do? We, we've thrown a lot at you. Your head might be spinning a little bit. Um, what do you do with all of this? Well, I think it goes without saying, we're, we've probably said it a few times a, a few times here, that you need to set up a special needs trust. If you've already set, up one, set one up for your loved one, your child, great. You need to take a fresh look at it. We can help you with that. If you don't have one, you need to create one. Going from not having a special needs trust, an updated plan, to having one is a quantum leap in the peace of mind you're gonna have and the security you are providing for your child. You gotta take a look at your existing overall plan, your trust, your power of attorney, your other documents to make sure they are all in sync and up to date. And as we talked about, you really need to think about Prop 19. Um, if you want your home or your rentals to be there for your child without a massive property tax increase, well, we need to think about steps we might take to protect your properties there. That can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars over time. And just kind of bringing it back to something we talked about earlier. This statement, I'm afraid to die. And again, this, isn't a, this is not about fear of, of the unknown or whatever the great beyond is, but it's that fear of who's gonna take care of my special needs child after I'm gone. And in many ways, a special needs trust is the most important tool that you can create to fill that role. So, uh... So this is why we invite you. We are obviously interested in educating everybody, but this is the work we do. So we invite you to meet with us, uh, to set a planning meeting with us. In a moment, Mark will just show the slide and tell you how you might do this. Um, you, know, you know this, it's a matter of feeling motivated. You know that we understand this area of law. You know you need to take these steps. So you know we just encourage you, don't put it off. So many folks do, don't put it off. Get together with us. We are efficient, we take care of things. And by the way, there's already a question about how we how, how we charge. Let me let me tell you that um, we don't do free consultations. We don't have uh, we, we do charge for meetings. It's the hourly rate of the attorney with whom you meet between four ninety five and six hundred ninety five dollars per hour. We are efficient. Uh, we have no complaints about our rates. Um, we tend to have flat fees, presumptive flat fees for documents for a special needs trust. By the way, typically twenty nine hundred dollars. 
Uh, sometimes more, sometimes things get very complicated, but that's our presumptive fee. Uh, uh, the family protection or dynasty trust, which lasts for generations, uh, usually 3,100, maybe a little bit more. So, you know, our fees are perhaps mainstream and uh, we, we, we take care of things. So Mark, yeah, share how, how to go about that, please. Yeah, so of course we would, it would be our privilege to work with you. And, and I wanna take a, just a moment you can take a deep breath here. We've gone through so much and, and we thank you. I mean, it looks like pretty much everybody who started with us is still here. So, so thank you for, for sticking this out with us. Your head might be spinning a little bit, but one thing that we always take pleasure in is, is educating and we want to deputize you. So now this is top of mind and having attention on something is so important. We live in the, you may have read terms like this, the attention economy, getting one's attention is so valuable. We have social media, we have media, we have so many things are pulling on us. And the moment that you step away from this, you're gonna think, oh, this is so important. And then it's gonna start to fade from your memory. And there's no benefit until you have these documents in place or up to date. So take action while it's top of mind. If you have loved ones who could benefit from this, let them know about it. We're gonna post this webinar online. If you're watching online, great. Share it with anybody you'd like. Um, and we hope we get the chance to work with you. If you don't end up working with us, just make sure you work with someone who really knows what they're doing, who focuses on special needs planning. It is a specialized area. But of course, we'd love the chance to work with you. To do that, you can contact Tim at our front desk. Very simple, Tim at gilfix.com. If you'd like to leave your contact information in our Q&A function that we only see that, nobody else does, you can leave your information. We'll get it from there and we'll reach out to you tomorrow um, to set a meeting. You can call us as well. Um, for some people, if you're not sure if we're a fit, we can offer 10 or 15 minute introductory, just Q&A calls, just to make sure you understand how we do things. You know, we encourage, if you wanna move forward, set a planning meeting so we can start to get to work for you right away. But for those of you who wanna just make sure that we're a fit and we're a fit for you, you're a fit for us, we can do uh, 10 to 15 minute introductory calls. We just asked if you're married, that both husband and wife take part in that call together. Um, but again, if you are ready to set a meeting, just do it. And we can, once you meet with us, we become sort of the, the taskmasters to get you to that finish line. Updating your plan, getting a plan in place is the most powerful thing you can do. Um, so, so thank you. So we're gonna go through some questions in yeah, a moment. Anything else you'd add? Just be, before we do that, I mean, if you're inclined to sign up with us, you know, don't, don't get distracted by the questions. Just human nature, I know. That's <laughs> a, I get distracted, you know, and I, and I get off target. So yeah, we have, uh, we are up to over 30 questions. Yeah, let's just see. select a couple. You know, it's, uh, we've, been, we've been at this over an hour. It's the evening, uh, baseball game on and all of that. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a couple. Uh, one asks, if there's a first party special needs trust, does the payback include SSDI? No, it doesn't. It's really Medi-Cal is the primary thing that's paid back. And another is uh, uh, implicitly a child with a disability owns stocks, stocks in her own name. It kind of implies that they're quite valuable. Would a first party special needs trust be appropriate? Yes. Um, and reference to a power of attorney, sometimes we have that child sign a power of attorney empowering the parent to transfer title. Remember, a parent can set up the first party special needs trust as well as the disabled child herself. So yeah, one good. Or two, uh, one, or, one or two yeah, you want to tackle. See a good one so from Yolanda um, about a concerns about a special needs child who's 46 years old, who's married someone who's interested in money. How can you make sure that the, the wife or, or whoever that is um, doesn't get any of that money when, when mom passes away? Well, a special needs trust. Uh, a special needs trust is a way where your child cannot control where that money goes. You say that it's there only for your child, not for your child's spouse while he's alive. And when he passes away, that money goes where you say it goes. Again, if it's a third party trust, you can say it goes to other family members or organ charitable organizations. The key is you have to set this up in your plan. So when you pass away, it goes to the trust and not to your son where he might give it away to the significant other. So special needs trust is the answer. So Naomi asks, can I set up a trust in California if the disabled person lives in another state or do you need to go to that state? First point is that we've set up countless special needs trusts for individuals in other states and people move. Uh, the language is that the, the, the key language is fundamentally sensitive to federal law. There are state nuances, but as long as the language is appropriate to deal with the federal rules regarding special needs planning, it's going to work anywhere. At the same time, if the individual is permanently living in another state, I would certainly have 
you talk with an attorney in that state, if not created there, because there can be some state differences, state programs that you have to be sensitive to. So yes, you can do it here and it will work. There are still reasons, let's face it, why you might want to talk to somebody there. Yeah, we have uh, questions about where monies from from a special needs trust go when someone passes away? Are there restrictions on where it can go? And not really. It, it, money in a, a special needs trust can go to a family protection trust for a sibling. It can go to an organization, go directly to a sibling. So really, no, there really aren't uh, restrictions on where it can go when a special needs trust beneficiary passes away. Some people will say, hey, if my child has kids of their own, special needs trust will go to their kids. So number of ways we can structure that. Um, and right. So a couple of questions here about uh, how the trusts are structured. So number one, you have your revocable trust. The special needs trust is a freestanding entity. It's a separate document. Yeah. And it is indeed different from a spendthrift trust. There's a good question about that. Debbie asks, uh, a spendthrift trust is designed with creditors in mind. It's not going to work to protect the assets from a problem with eligibility for government benefits. Yes. Um, and I see Andrea asked a few good questions. I think Andrea, we can set up a, a separate chat to go over yours. You have a lot Andrea of good has lots questions. of questions. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, and a lot are pretty technical. So um, one is about how do we put money into a special needs trust that hasn't been funded yet? I think it's good just to understand how you would put money into a special needs trust. It's actually quite simple. Um, you set up a, a tax ID number for the trust. We can help with that. You take the tax ID number and the trust to a bank and you open up an account. You put money in it and then the trust has to become is a separate taxpayer not super hard to set that up you can set up a schwab account fidelity account bank account a lot of different ways um, to do that um let's see about some other any other questions that stand out to you mike i know we do want to you know, i, I know just, we haven't just, been able to get to everything i think just one more i mean uh you know it's late we got to liberate folks okay one is uh, we talk when we talked about trustees could two friends be named as co-trustees yes I, you know, the, those, the person who creates the special needs trust calls the shots. You could name three people as co-trustees. We discourage that, but you know, it's your money. You're calling this out. You're creating the entity and the management system. So it's in your hands to decide who the trustee is going to be, whether it's one or two people, an entity and a person up to you. You control it. Yes, although we typically don't recommend co-trustees. Yeah, if you can I mentioned it. It, create, it makes it harder for- well, uh, I think we're- I think we're set, huh? It's uh, been a great yeah. evening, an energizing yeah. evening. And if you do have questions about how we set up different trusts and packages, you know, call us, set a meeting with us. We can go into that because some of this gets into some, some details. But uh, again, you know, thank you so much for being here. You can contact contact us. I'm going to share. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing because you guys have seen this screen for enough. So now you can just see us a little bit more for better or worse. Um, Again, thank you guys so much for, for spending the time here with us. You know, it'd be our privilege to get to serve you and your families. But, but bottom line, uh, I hope you learned a lot. There is so much that you can do. Don't feel helpless. The world is a chaotic and scary place, especially the last year. This is something you can control and this is something we can help you with. Just don't delay. While this is top of mind, take action, contact us, set a meeting and let us go to work for you. Um, this is what we do. So from our family of our professional and literal, literally from my family to yours. Um, thank you so much for attending. And uh, we hope you got a lot out of it. Spread the word, you know, let your friends know. We're gonna send you a link to this later, but please spread the word. Um, and I hope you got a lot out of this. Stay safe, healthy, and sane, and hope everybody has a wonderful spring and summer. Take Good care. Night all. <laughs>